Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Olivia Cantrell, and my project was uh, titled Mental Health and Stigmatization, the Banality of Apathy, and we'll get to why. Um, so starting off with a question that drives most of the research in psychology, and uh, we ask ourselves probably a lot, the simple question of what is normal? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have that simple of an answer. But when we think about what it means when we say it to others or others say it to us, or more importantly, when we say it to ourselves, what beliefs does that imply or what stigma does that propagate? For example, um, this is uh, the depiction of what self-stigmatization looks like. Uh, when you see a public example, for example, someone with mental illness is blank and Therefore, you start to internalize that belief and try it on. Uh, and you think that you or that uh, you might have that mental illness, then uh, you might determine that that is your attribute as well. So why did I call this uh, the banality of apathy? Um, so what inspired this research was uh, back in my last Jan term, I was lucky, I was lucky enough to study uh, the uh, stress and disease in the 21st century and notice the emerging patterns of increasing mental health concerns, especially in younger populations. Um, and this is staggering, um, considering the increasing awareness coinciding uh, at the same time, uh, it prompts the need for uh, more analysis on what the cultural consciousness and stigmatization uh, contributes to uh, those affected by mental illness. Um, so I'm going to cover five different topics, uh, education and environment, sociocultural and interpersonal factors, multimedia influence and disparities in mental health. And um, all this research uh, was essentially to be an explanation or uh, to set up for my podcast, which is the second part of my project. Uh, so, the podcast. Um, this was uh, to focus on spreading information and be able to synthesize information that I found from my literature review uh, and be able to transcend the hardships of uh, those suffering from mental health struggles uh, and be able to uh, rehumanize and cultivate more compassion for these uh, individuals and groups affected and also heighten awareness and mental health literacy among uh, whoever's willing to listen. Um, so yes, uh, stigma is largely found in a lack of knowledge about mental health and thus creates uh, ill-conceived knowledge or attitudes and uh, propagates uh, that internalization of the mental health uh, framework as we saw. So the making of my podcast was uh, kind of new to me, although uh, I really enjoyed the process of being able to uh, invite different guests who had more experience than me in psychology and learn a lot from them with a dialogue that was structured around the literature review, but uh, went on a different discourse that uh, taught me a lot. And so uh, I reviewed all the footage and was able to upload it and design it uh, onto a SoundCloud page. Um, so looking at environmental and educational factors, um, what really uh, strikes me is the increasing rates in children and specifically uh, under, uh, under age 25, um, that is the highest population of uh, mental health cases. In fact, about 50% of adolescents are expected to have a mental illness of some sort. And uh, that of course, touches back into if you really have a diagnostic uh, label, then that is different than feeling depressed, of course. So of course this ties back into uh, what is normal. So self-devaluation can uh, also be an attribute through um, educational factors such as um, lack of parental care or support and lack of uh, good teacher relationships. So um, we will look at student well-being and hopefully be able to determine. Um, 
sociocultural and interpersonal factors. This is uh, how a lot of stigma is carried via diffusion in personal interactions. So uh, this is the framework basically modeling um, the knowledge and the culture and the network feed into stigma. Therefore, um, we see that uh, there are different kinds of stigma when you look at public stigma and self-stigma. Um, so that goes back into the uh, concept of the modified labeling theory. When you see that, oh, this mental illness is perceived as lazy or um, incapable or some uh, attribute or characteristic, then you would apply it to yourself. So multimedia influence also is why I chose a podcast format. Um, I believe that a lot of the depictions we see of mental illness in media are very dramatically over sensationalized and can propagate prejudice and exclusion or uh, discrimination. So uh, being able to identify uh, accurate depictions and dramatized ones will help uh, be able to recognize mental illness in ourselves and each other. So disparities in mental health care uh, definitely was a theme throughout uh, the research. There are uh, certain demographics that are underreported and um, underserved. Therefore, we uh, are prompting more research in the areas of what in minoritized communities can be done. And uh, that involves what is described as sliding scale and group therapies, which are uh, emerging in more and more places for uh, accommodating uh, lower income communities. And so given the research prompting that, um, we found that anonymity is a huge aspect of disclosing your mental health care. So um, if you feel that you don't want to respond to a survey in, uh, in person, then that could skew the results. And that was uh, definitely a common theme. Uh, on the other hand, um, contact-based intervention face-to-face -face and uh, revealing your own personal experiences with mental health has been proven to uh, have strong effects in long-lasting uh, destigmatization in attitudes. Um, all right, so moving on to further implications. Um, <clears throat> when we strengthen the economic support for families and for communities that are underserved with um, mental health care interventions and, uh, and also need uh, a greater representation in studies, um, we can focus our studies more on that and also contact-based intervention. Like I mentioned, is one of the most effective ways to counter ignorance and also rehumanize those with mental illness. Um, so I just want to, before I move on and transition to um, showing you a clip of the podcast, I just want to thank my sponsor, Margot Katz, who uh, was very kind and checked on me and supported my ambitions for this project, as well as Kay Sanders for being very supportive and providing a great semester, and um, the podcast guests, who you'll be able to hear in a moment. Um, and of course, the Whittier Scholars Program uh, for giving me all the, res the resources that could help me succeed and be able to create this. Um, and of course, my family and friends uh, for helping me along the way. <laughs> they know. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to Okay. I hope it's switched screens. Okay. So uh, this is the um, psych podcast. So I am just going to play one of my favorite insights I got from speaking with um, Dr. Kelly H. Um, and so let's get me shut in. And again, it's being this part of the California where we don't typically do that. Um, that vitamin D deficiency that we're so used to with the sunlight is so important and we forget about that. And that's why we get sad seasonal affective disorder from November until April when we're in that fall and winter months, those dead months that we see the leaves come down and we see the darkness come and the ground gets really damp. Well, not so damp here, but <laughs> a damp for us in Californians. But <laughs> yes. um, it's the vitamin D deficiency and vitamin D depletion. And so like, so COVID was like November and April. 
And we've had this a very elongated fall winter that has now lasted eight months. And ironically, we're in November starting on Sunday. So it's going to be like a whole year of fall and winter. Now, some of us love fall, but for a lot of people, fall and winter are death seasons for a reason because of the lack of vitamin D. So in those periods of time where we started COVID, that's what was important was, look, at, if you can't get out, out, get out into the backyard, create community outside in the confines of your property. Put color in your world, cut some flowers, buy some bouquets, go get some bedding plants, have them shipped to you from Home Depot and Lowe's, grow them in your garden, create a DIY, take it from beginning to middle to end. Why? Because one of the things that people forget about with mental health is, is that mental health has an end. It's not always a winter, but when you're in it, that's all you see. And what comes after winter? Spring. What is spring? It's rebirth, it's regrowth, life starts again. And when people get despondent and they get hopeless and helpless, and when that depression gets severe, they only see the winter. And so we have to kind of almost create a spring for our winter. Now, that's not always easy to do. I, I don't want to disrespect anyone who suffers from a depression because I understand it. This is not so easy to do. But it's what we have to do to get through it. We use things like medication to help us so that we can get the energy that we need to get to the ability to create that spring sometimes that's what we need to do but it's about making sure that you stay relevant to that hope and so you have to create things in your universe that's time with people you care about that's creating something that beginning middle end process i see it start from you know this wall that was a hot mess and then i made it kind of more messy with my creation and at the end there's this beautiful wall that i did right there's hope that came out of this devastation this nastiness this grossness you have to keep looking at things like that we look at art you know so much of art came out of emotional distress music a lot of it we're attracted to because it speaks to our emotional distress it helps us to stay relevant to getting to the other side of it and so it's about how do i get a spring how do i create color when that winter is going on too long, I have to find those resources in order to cope and survive and get on the other side of it because it does come to a different conclusion and there is a spring at the end. Some springs take years, some take a couple of months, but spring always comes after that winter. Realistically. Sorry, so uh, that was uh, one of my favorite clips that I wanted to be able to share with you guys, but um, I'm also happy to share the website address. I think I'm already pushing my time, um, but I would like to play one, a little bit of one more, if that's okay, from uh, Tiffany's podcast. It just has a very useful, I think, uh, message for us that uh, could ap apply to a variety of situations, just dealing with uh, interpersonal relations with mental health conversations. What sort of coping methods or strategies may have been helpful for you or others that you've worked with in your field? Because in regard to the qualms that we're all feeling as a collective culture, I am kind of interested in, um, if you would like to elaborate on that idea, like what holding space means. Yeah, so within the field, at least with my colleagues and peers, there's this term called holding space that we use both personally in our lives and definitely professionally. And so what holding space means is that I'm going to hold the time and physical space, or maybe not physical during these times, virtual space for you to feel whatever you feel. And oftentimes that's pain and stress. And I'm not going to tell you, you need to get rid of it. I'm going to hold the space and time you need to feel what you need to feel and then support you in dealing with those feelings, support you in regulating your stress and emotions, support you in de-escalating from your crises or dealing with your crises, whatever it is, holding space looks like being present with somebody and not forcing an agenda really. You know, of course there are things in the field that we could bring into this space that will help, but we're not going to pull somebody any which way where it's um, harmful to them. And holding space with our friends looks like listening to them complain and not trying to have, solve their problems and listening to them and 
you know, their pain and their circumstances and ensuring them that you are there and that you're not going anywhere. You don't have to have the words to respond. You can just acknowledge that you hear them and that you're there with them. Um, okay, so um, I don't know if I can play just like a little clip of the coping with COVID, but um, actually, I guess that'll just give you guys a uh, reason to return to the website. So I can throw that in the chat. But um, yeah, I would like to return back and open it up to questions. <laughs> 